Good morning. Welcome to Metropolitan Community Church of the Blue Ridge. We're glad you're here with us. I was going to say this bright, sunny morning, but that would not be true at all. And I've heard too many untrue things said from pulpits. It's a rainy morning, but we're not blessed with having too much rain. We're blessed with being just fine with it. We hope you've had a good week. Hope you've been able to find ways to love each other and to love the Lord. <clears throat> We want to remind you of just a couple of things. One is that we have Bible study always on Tuesday night at 7. We're starting a new topic, but I don't know what it is yet. And also, we're going to be doing our Thanksgiving boxes, baskets a little differently this year. We're going to take uh, slips from our food pantry people and choose some of those and anybody in the church that may need help. But we're not here every week to bring potatoes one week, to bring stuffing one week. What we're asking you to do is send some money to us and we will get together and see how many baskets we can put. We estimate, estimate that a basket would be about $25. But if you only have $2 or $5 or 100 feel free to send it in. You can do that through the website or you can do that through the mail. And you probably know the addresses and websites already. We're here today. It's National Coming Out Day. We talked about that a little bit later. But mostly we're here today to praise the Lord and to be thankful that we're together. Their pastor has resigned and the church itself is fairly new. 
We also want to remember our people who are most exposed than the rest of us to COVID. Our medical folks, EMTs, fire people, also for our schools, for our teachers and all the staff there, for our retail people, and also for our food service people. You say, you say that every week. I want us to remember. I want us to remember and pray for these folks every time we think about it. As I said, today is National Coming Out Day, October 11th. And you say, well, I'm not LGBTQI. Why do I need to come out? You may need to come out as an ally. You may need to come out as, I know some of those folks, those folks. Sometimes we have to come out to us who we are, who we truly are. Sometimes we have to come out as Christians because people think various groups of people can't be Christians. Sometimes we have to come out as married. Remember the first time I checked that little box. But most of all, we need to remember that we're all people of worth. We're all people of worth. Someone wrote in a, a message, not to me, but another comment said that they were thankful for those who came before that left footprints I can follow. And I was kind of surprised because this is one of our senior LGBT folks. I think, I wonder who left the footprints for them. But the most important thing about coming out is coming out as a believer in Jesus Christ. Coming out as someone who believes in the power of God and the love of Jesus and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So you may not need to come out to anybody. I've been out so long, I don't know what in is. And you know, everybody doesn't have to come out. You may have to just come out to yourself. Most of all, know that you're a beloved child of God. Loving God, we thank you this day for your many blessings. We thank you for all the ways you are with us. You are with us, before us, behind us, beside us. We ask that you surround the people we've mentioned who deal with COVID more than anyone else, especially our medical people. We lift up Rachel. We lift up Janice and others in our community that we know are right there in the front lines. We thank you for the people that have continued to serve us, serve our meals, sell us things, make sure we have what we need. We ask that you be with the prayer requests that have been mentioned for surgeries coming up, for health issues, for closings, for other things that we need to remember. And we ask that you wrap your arms around this church in Florida, that group of believers who knew that you called them together. May they find their next steps and their next pastor. We love you, we honor you, we hope to serve you. In your name we pray, amen. <clears throat>
and say, can we sing it again? I said, I always love the music. I always love all of your music. When I tell you the scripture today, you're probably going to go, oh no, I've heard that 5,000 times. By the way, if you are watching us, I would appreciate it if you would hit like or heart or angry or whatever button so that we will know that you were here because the messages that come up on the screen don't transfer to us later. Our scripture today is from Psalm 23 from the Message Bible. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and send me in the right direction. Even when the way goes through Death Valley, I am not afraid. When you walk at my side, your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. You serve me a six-course dinner right in front of my enemies. You revive my drooping head. My cup brims with blessings. Your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life, and I'm back at home in the house of God for the rest of my life. One of the commentaries I was reading said every preacher should have two Psalm 23 sermons, one for a funeral and one for times like this. And probably most of you have heard Psalm 23 the most from King James at funerals. And it is a real comfort at that time. But I think there's more to this psalm. I think there's more to what we can get from this psalm. It breaks up into several little divisions in its six short verses. First, we see the shepherd's provision, not lacking anything. The shepherd's protection, even through the valley of death. We'll talk about that in a minute. The shepherd's protection in the presence of enemies. And the shepherd's preservation will keep us all the days of our lives, forever. <clears throat> the very first verse of this it begins like a good paragraph when you were going to school. <clears throat> because the teacher would say, Come out with your theme sentence. And I just wanted to write. I didn't know that I had to do it in a structure. But it sets the theme, and then the rest of the psalm unfolds from there. The psalmist says, I don't need a thing. I hear that sometimes when you say, what can I get you for Christmas? What can I get you for your birthday? I don't need a thing. And in truth, most of us, hearing this and sitting in this room, we don't need anything. Now, that doesn't mean we don't want stuff, <laughs> which we'll talk about in a minute, but we don't need anything. This is a real anti-culture to the one we live in. This is at odds with our culture. We're supposed to be a consumer. There was a thing this morning on the CBS program at 9 o'clock. It talked about how so many of our objects now, like phones and other things, are made to not last. Why? So they can sell us another one. Some of them are made so you can't even repair them. We're told to be a consumer. You're not happy. You need more stuff. I'm about to the point of our next move involving a match. <laughs> you, we, need, we think we need more stuff. And the psalmist says to reset our consumer mentality. What do we really need? What will enhance our lives in a positive way? What will increase our ability to do ministry? And then the psalmist also encourages us to reset the hyperactivity of our lives. I think COVID has done a lot of that. COVID has made more people, not everybody, but made more people stay home, not be out in such crowded things. And sometimes we've had to look at life in different ways. Some of us have read more. Some of us have done more work in our yard. Some people have cooked more. And just done things that kind of relax and settle us down. Now, I hear a lot where people say, I'm over this, I'm ready for regular life. And I think most of us are to some degree. Dry cleaning companies are losing money because everybody's working from home and you don't have to be fancy for that. But we need to reset our activity. Zalma says, you make me lie down, you give me back my life, you restore my life. Many of you have children or you've been around kids. You know when they're just so tired and they're just running around and running around and you almost have to force them to lie down, settle down, take a nap. 
the psalmist promises to restore our lives. I think this especially is true of many people who work in churches and in nonprofit organizations. We get so caught up in the hyperactivity that we need time to restore. As a part-time pastor, especially during COVID, I haven't had as busy a schedule as I used to have five or 10 years ago. And I had a full weekend of church stuff, ministry stuff. I looked at Joanna Saturday night and I said, and I did this every week? I did this all the time? We need to take time to let God restore our lives, restore our energy, restore our spirits. Many people come to church or listen to church hoping to have their life restored, hoping to have their souls restored, to be able to get back to focus. And that's why I think it's important that we find somebody somewhere to listen to, to be spoken to, to be ministered to every week or even every day. Because we need that reminder that the worst is never the worst and that the best is yet to come. Verse 3 encourages us to savor and enjoy God's gifts. Savor and enjoy. A few weeks ago, or longer, our friend Felicia was here and she made us scallops. Oh my goodness. They were so good. And we ate and ate and ate. Joanna couldn't eat her last two. She gave them to me. Thank you, thank you. I got down to the last bite of the last one. And I just kept chewing and chewing. And finally, Felicia says, is it really tough? I said, no, it tastes so good, I don't want to swallow it. I don't want to get rid of that taste. We need to be able to save our life, save our relationship with God, save the food that we have for our soul, save those paths that God leads us on. And then it says, fear no evil. Or in the message it says, I'm not afraid. Well, you know, I believe that evil is real. I believe that evil is real. There are bad things that happen. There are bad people that do the bad things. But God is with us even in those darkest times. Even in those times that seem most unfair. Even in those times that seem most damaging. The psalm says, that I'm not afraid, even when the way goes through dark death valley or a dark valley. You know, many of us have experienced people we love dying. And it is a dark time. Even if they have lived a huge long life and been totally happy and go out reaching for the Lord, it's still a dark time for us, for the people that we miss. But God's presence is with us even in those times. It says the rod and staff for Texas in the King James. And here it's called a trusty shepherd's crook. Rod and staff. I love that idea because there's the staff. You know what I'm talking about, the rod and the staff. There's the staff to pull us back from the wrong way, to direct us in the right way. And then there's the rod to take care of, in the shepherd's case, the animals that come up. The rod to protect us from the thoughts that will take us down. The rod to protect us when we don't need to be in a particular situation. And if you've ever noticed that all of a sudden from being a shepherd out in the field taking care of the sheep, it changes. It changes. And now the shepherd becomes a gracious host. The strange thing about that is shepherds were not thought of as people who would be hosting parties. Shepherds were usually the lowest of the lowest of the lowest of people. They stayed out in the fields with the sheep. They seldom came to town. Remember the Christmas story. They seldom came to town, and when they did, people stayed away from them primarily because they smelled bad. But now we go to being a gracious host. And again, it's not the shepherd who brings the sheep in and kills them and makes the meal. It says that you serve me. God, you serve me. God provides again. God again provides the meal. He's the one that helps us to be an honored guest. It says we anoint your head with oil. Some of you think about the Easter story, the woman that anointed Jesus. This wasn't just Jesus that had been done to, it was any honored guest. And yes, there are enemies around us, but God has our back. Enemies are present, but they've been rendered harmless. There is a, uh, a book by Andrew Greeley that talks about God's, God chasing him down to get this man in the book into the Bible. Because it's not just that goodness and mercy follow us, 
I love how the message got thrown up, in my opinion, the right word. Beauty and love chase after me. Beauty and love chase after me. So maybe you've heard this story before when I started going to MCC in Norfolk. At the end of the service, I noticed they would join hands and sing the Lord's Prayer. I didn't want those people touching me. I didn't know them. I didn't know if I wanted to have them hold my hand. So when we get to the first note of that, I was out the door. The first week, the second week, the third week, I had hardly cleared the steps when Reverend Doris Berry, some of you know who she is and was, came down the steps and said, Stop, who are you? Who are you? And that was being chased down. I had to go back and thank God I did. And it gets to the last part of this. I'm back at home in the house of God for the rest of my life. At home, that intimate, personal experience. You know the things you do at home that you would do in somebody else's house? No examples. No examples. But this is telling us, <laughs> Rachel, we have a moment over there. This is telling us that we can have that intimate relationship with God and know that trust. And we know that it'll probably take us to a community of faith. And you know, just being around some people feel like home. You know what I mean? You may not be in their house or your house, you may be having dinner, but it feels like home. And God promises that we can have that intimate home relationship with God. I want to finish with a different rendition of Psalm 23. It's from the message, uh, from the book Psalms Now that I've shared things from before. It was written by a person named Leslie Brandt, and when I first got it, I was so excited because I thought Leslie was a woman. I found out later it was a man. But I love how he rephrases the 23rd Psalm. Lord, you are my constant companion. There's no need that you cannot fill. Whether your course for me points to the mountaintops of glorious ecstasy or to the valleys of human suffering, you are by my side. You are ever present with me. You are close beside me. When I tread the dark streets of danger and even when I flirt with death itself, you will not leave me. When the pain is severe, you are near to comfort. When the burden is heavy, you are there to lean upon. When depression darkens my soul, you touch me with eternal joy. When I feel empty and alone, you fill the aching vacuum with your power. My security is in your promise to be near me always and in the, um, and in the knowledge that you will never let me go. We all need a shepherd. And that shepherd is right here with us, available. Let him chase you down. Amen. chasing us down to show us love and mercy. Some of us have been chased out of churches or chased out of places of worship. But God is chasing after us and bringing us, whether it's to the film, the video, whether it's to a building, whether it's to this table, even in your own home, bringing us to this place to show us love, mercy, and grace. The night before Jesus was crucified, he took bread from the table. He lifted it to heaven. He gave thanks for it. He blessed it, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat of it, each of you. And as part of that Passover meal, he took a cup, and he lifted it up, and he gave thanks for it, and he blessed it. He said, this is my blood out for you as a sign of a new and everlasting covenant. My blood shed for the forgiveness of all sin. And whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, do so in memory of me. One of the ways we remember the wonderful works of Christ is when we say, Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ is coming again. 
Hallelujah. So often when I say that line, coming again, I know most of us think about the time when Jesus comes back. But I think about how Jesus comes back into our life time after time after time. We can walk away, we can run, but we can't hide. And Jesus comes back into our life, sometimes in the most unexpected ways. Loving God, bless these elements. Help us to slow down so you can catch us quicker. Help us to remember that you gave of your very self so that we can have life and life eternal and life filled with hope and joy. For these we give you thanks. Amen. separate us from the love of the shepherd. Amen.